after a hiatus of, of most of the spring. I don't remember quite when we had our lice grand rounds, but it's been a while. It's our tradition when we start off a new semester to have a particularly esteemed speaker join us, and certainly we, ha we have that today. And I will introduce our speaker to you in, in just a moment. Uh, are we anticipate that we'll be um, virtual for the entire fall semester? Um, as far as the spring goes, we'll see. And just to call out for everybody, we have shifted the agenda just slightly starting now at 8 a.m. instead of 7.45. I've been working with one of our wonderful chief residents, Dr. Weininger Cohen, in developing our schedule. We are completely booked for the fall and really excited about our a wonderfully diverse group of, of experts in their fields and looking forward to their sharing their expertise with us. We certainly are welcoming recommendations for speakers for the spring, and you should feel free to re reach out either to David or to myself with those recommendations, and we'll look forward to having a great spring lineup as well. Dr. Roseanne Leip Leipzig is a, is a great friend to the department, and she is also the Gerald and May Ellen Ritter Professor of Geriatrics and Adult Development at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. She is as well a professor in palliative medicine and health policy. And over the course of her really remarkable career has been one of the architects in shaping what excellence in geriatric care looks like from a clinical perspective, from an educational perspective, and from a policy perspective. For example, working with the US Preventative Services Task Force and helping us understand who and whom we should be screening, for example, for osteoporosis, for type two diabetes, how we should be managing things like COPD in this population, and really has done so much to shape what excellence looks like, as I say, and help us understand how to provide care throughout the entire continuum of life. Some of you will know Dr. Leipzig was also my attending when I was a third year resident at St. Vincent's Medical Center when she was chief of geriatrics at St. Vincent's in the 1990s. And for the trainees, I, it's hard to predict which attendings will stay with you. And it's not gonna be dozens. There will likely be two or three just, that just kind of lodge in your mind as people of excellence or people perhaps who took a particular interest in you as a person and as a growing professional. And Dr. Leipzig was such a person for me. And I've thought about that a great deal in the years since. Why was it that someone like Roseanne Leipzig became a model for me of who I hope to be as I grew in my career in medicine? Certainly it was her clinical excellence it was her humanity. It was certainly the interest that she took in me as a person, her caring of me as a person, as of, you know, at that point, a senior resident, trying to get to that point of being confident and taking care of patients on my own. And that was one of the things I've realized that it was about Dr. Leipzig. It was the confidence that she brought to the care of patients, that she brought to team meetings, that she brought to attending rounds, that I aspire to myself. And if you've been with me on the wards, you'll know that I'll say to you that one of the things, one of your goals as a trainee is to develop that personal confidence that you'll need to carry you through your career, particularly in the interest in having a joyful career. And then the other thing I think I've realized is that it was Dr. Leipzig that taught me the importance of patients. As consultants, as primary teams, as, pay, as doctors taking care of in the outpatient setting, we're often in a moment of feeling pressured to do something, whatever it might be. And it was Dr. Leipzig that taught me the importance of waiting to allow the therapeutics that have already been applied to do their work and to allow time itself to do its work. So Dr. Leipzig, it's really a delight for us to have you back with us and welcome. Thank you very much, Sam. I don't think I've ever received such a nice, uh, meaningful introduction. So thank you. And hello to everybody there who um, I see on the little screens uh, who I've known over the years. It's a pleasure to be back. I actually was supposed to be your last Grand Round speaker in the spring um, and when we locked down. So it's really a pleasure to be back. And I'm gonna be talking to you about prognosis. And I know the last six months we've done a lot on prognosis. 
uh, COVID has forced us all to think about where this person is going and what is their trajectory in a disease that we had no idea what their trajectory was to begin with. So I'm gonna to talk to you about this in particular about older adults, but it's really about anybody who has a serious illness or is about to undergo um, an intervention. So let me start with my learning objectives, which is to get you to understand the very close relationship between function and prognosis. That for certain common diseases, there are indicators that should put a little light bulb in your head to signify a change in the patient's trajectory. And that there are skills that you can learn to help you in prognostication and how you discuss prognosis with older adults and their families and anyone with serious illness. So let me start with a little bit of history on medical prognostication. Um, let's get our terms right to begin with. So we're talking about prediction of an outcome for a specific patient. And as you know, the literature gives us these outcomes for groups of patients. But what about the person who's right in front of you? And this involves two skills. The first is foreseeing, being able to formulate the prediction. And the second, equally hard, is communicating the prediction, foretelling. So we're talking about different types of situations. Prognosis is not always how long will I live, but it's also how will I live? And it's for normal aging, disease processes, and as I mentioned before, interventions. How will I live if I have surgery or chemotherapy? And how will I live if I don't? There are also different types of survival. Again, life and death, but really for most people, it's the quality of their life that's important. So what do we mean by quality? We're talking about how will I be able to live independently? Will I be able to get around on my own? And very importantly, will I suffer? So why does this matter in the care of older adults? It helps with better decision-making. Patients and family want to know this. It helps us help them choose wisely, have the information to figure out what works with their values and what doesn't. So I'm gonna give you a couple of examples of how good or not so good we may be with giving uh, prognostic information. And this was a study that was done after the death of patients with dementia, where they went to the healthcare proxies and asked them some questions about what they had heard. Now, I recognize that people don't always hear what they're told, believe me. But I think these numbers are so significant that they tell us something. 18% of the proxies remembered receiving prognostic information. Only 33 were counseled on dementia-related complications. What's going to happen besides the fact that their memory is going to go? And most importantly, when the healthcare proxy understood prognosis and the clinical course of advanced dementia, they opted for more comfort-oriented care for their loved ones. <clears throat> Time to benefit is an important piece of deciding whether to do something or not, and particularly for older adults. My friend Dave Rubin wrote in JAMA, when you're 83, we're not talking about 20 more years most of the time, okay? So how long does it take to benefit from these things that we tend to do for primary prevention? And I kept aspirin for primary prevention in there because if you don't know it, a couple of years ago, some great studies came out that basically said healthy 70-year-olds and older are more likely to have harm than to benefit from um, aspirin for prevention for cardiovascular disease. That one changed my practice. But if you think about this, you know, for prostate cancer screening, if there's a benefit, it's a long time. And colon cancer screening, this is the best data we have at this point, and it's with sigmoidoscopy, but you can see that the peop that, you know, there's a little bit of a, uh, uh, um, movement between the curves here, but you don't really see an effect until out here, okay? We're talking about 10 years. So if you're not gonna make it 10 years, you're probably not gonna benefit 
from colon cancer screening, which is the reason for the uh, suggestion that we stop at age 85 and we do um, shared decision-making with people who are, 60, who are 75 to 85. A historical view is also very interesting. In the 1700s, basically, physicians wanted to avoid gloomy prognostications. They felt deception was morally justified because you were taking away hope. Move up almost 300 years, and physicians said that they disclosed prognosis for only a third of the patients they referred to hospice. Definition of hospice, that you think they're not gonna live six months. This I'm sure you still agree with, uh, physicians feeling they receive poor training on prognostication. We also are uncomfortable, so we avoid it. <clears throat> we wait to be asked. Recent studies, physicians with, would withhold prognostic estimates from 60% of patients, even if the patients insisted. And we give the least honest figures to those with the worst prognoses. 80% of patients now want as much information as possible, whether it's good or bad. Now, obviously, there are some cultural differences. There are, you know, this is not everyone, but the vast majority of people want to know what to expect. So these are six studies that were done looking at patients at the end of their lives. And what the docs told the families was the estimated survival. So that's right here, the median estimated survival. And this is the actual survival of those patients. And if you take a look over here, you see that we give two to five times um, greater estimated estimated survival than actual survival. So I think we do have a chance for improvement. And part of this, and anybody who's been, been uh, practicing for a while is quite aware of it, um, as you see more patients, you have a much better idea of what's important in prognostication. There are also skills that can improve over time. And there are tools that exist that I'm going to tell you about that can improve a clinician's ability to prognosticate. So let me start at the beginning, which is healthy, which is all um, adults. Medium life expectancy, what is that? That's the age to which 50% of people can expect to live or more, okay? So there is a median life expectancy at birth, and at 65, it's longer because obviously you've already made it 65 years. Now, if I had you in front of me, I'd have you scream out, what do you think the median life expectancy is for people who are 65? And so that question is really, people who are 60, half of people who are 65 will live to what age or more? So answer that for yourself. to 84. Now I've asked that question on rounds <laughs> with medicine residents and I have received the answer 70. Okay, as somebody who is now over age 65, <laughs> that's a little disconcerting. But I also say to them, you know, you gotta get out of the hospital. You've gotta see people who are not old and sick. You need to see people who are old and healthy. At age 85, Still, 92, and this is the point where the difference between men and women starts to go away, and they have much more similar uh, life ex median life expectancies. But even at 100, people can expect to live, 50% of them will live two and a half years or more. Okay? Now, I'm not gonna pretend that's for everybody, it's, it's statistically for everyone, but if you look by race, there is a significant difference here. And although it was worse in 1970 than in 2010 for Black Americans, it's still pretty bad. So we need to recognize that when we're looking and thinking about um, these prognostic tools. In older adults, when we talk about prognostication, function rules. 
And those of you who've worked in oncology know that, okay? It's that global sense of what are they able to do? The Karnofsky score is a great example. Function predicts mortality, it predicts morbidity, and it predicts your quality of life. So I'm gonna tell you about three of my patients. These are actually not my patients. They're based on my patients. And the pictures I got off the internet are pretty close to my patients. Um, but what I want, the point I wanna make is you can't use age as a marker, okay? These are three people, Rose, Letitia, and Nancy. Let me tell you about them. Rose was 90 when I made the slide. She's actually now 93. Her health is still excellent. She has new onset systolic hypertension, like 90% of 90 year olds. And she has a great chance of making it to 100. This is Letitia. She's 78. She's had diabetes for 40 years. She has low vision from the diabetes, which really affects the quality of her life. And she has COPD. On top of all of that, she now has a diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis. And her concerns are pain, being able to use her hands, and that she's depressed and she's scared. Nancy is also 90. She has mild Alzheimer's and COPD. She lives alone. She has a very strong social network, but her closest relative, not in a nursing home, in New Hampshire. And her concerns are that she had a 10 pound weight loss. She has decreased exercise tolerance. She's having much more difficulty walking and she doesn't know what medication she's taking which concerns me greatly. So the take home message, if you take home one from this entire talk, is for older adults, one size fits all doesn't work. We need to stratify. And the stratification that the oncologist came up with that a lot of us are starting to use is the concept of fit, vulnerable, or frail, okay? So what does that mean? I'm gonna to explain to you how you get to that point and then what it means by telling you a couple of different ways to measure function. The first are single measures that you can do with your patients. The second are frailty indices. And the third uh, is um, disease trajectory, moments at which you say things have changed for this patient. And the last are prognostic indices that you can use as um, kind of algorithms. So the single measures are gait speed. These are at your usual pace, okay? Walking 13 feet at, or four meters and slow is less than 0.6 meters per second. Fast is greater than one meter per second. And another similar measure called the timed up and go, which is 10 feet, again, at usual pace and they turn around get up out of chair, they walk the 10 feet, they turn around and come back. How long does it take? And for the outcomes we're gonna be talking about, the cutoff is 15 seconds or more, okay? So at one year, slow gait speed or a timed up and go over 15 predicts global health declines, new difficulties in ADL like bathing or walking, and falls, okay? One simple test that can help you see who's at risk of all of these. They also predict post-operative complications. And this is the second important take-home point, that when you are doing your pre-op consultations, it's really important to decide if this person is fit, vulnerable, or frail. And I'll show you that in the next few slides. So slow gait speed, for a test of major morbidity and mortality after cardiac surgery, it was an incremental predictor. The slower you walked, the more trouble you ran into with surgery. The time to up and go, similarly a predictive, predictor of post-operative complications and one year of mortality. Frailty indices. There are several, none are totally accepted. There are some now you can put into the EMR. Um, and some hospitals are actually doing that. What is frailty? Um, it's for those of you old enough to remember, Justice Potter Stewart, um, frailty 
was asked, what is pornography? And he says he didn't have a definition, but he knew it when he saw it. And that's how most of us feel about frailty. And that's true, but it doesn't mean we're picking it all up. What we're talking about here is a decrease in physiologic reserve. So you have diminished resiliency, loss of adaptive capacity, and greater vulnerability to stressors, which is, of course, what ends our patients up in the hospital. People of the same age differ in vulnerability to adverse health outcomes, and this is an attempt to quantify that. People who are frail by any of these different um, uh, uh, indices are at high risk for everything you don't want. Okay. This has all been shown. So I'm going to start by talking about phenotypic frailty, which uh, was developed by Linda Freed, who is the um, head of the Mailman School for Public Health. And she came up with five predictors. The first was unintentional weight loss. The second was a loss in grip strength. So it's in the lowest 20% for sex and BMI. You can see that this is not something that's easy to do in the office. Exhaustion, somebody who reports that everything is an effort, could not get going for three or more days last week. Slowness, their walking speed over 15 feet is in the lowest 20%. And low activity, they just don't do as much as they did. And her scoring, if you had one of these, you were still considered robust. If you had two to three, you were pre-frail or vulnerable. And if you had four to five, you were considered frail. So this is, let me walk you through the slide. These are people who at baseline were robust, pre-frail and frail. And these are three-year and seven-year outcomes for death, first hospitalization, first fall, worsening ADL disability, and worsening mobility disability. And you can see for each one of these, the more frail you are, at three years or at seven years, the more likely you are to have this problem, okay? So frailty definitely um, correlates with outcomes. They also, as I mentioned, correlate with um, post-op outcomes. So here, what's interesting is that both the pre-frail and the frail have similar risks of post-operative complications, longer length of stay, and discharge to skilled or assisted living facility after previously living at home. And of course, this has a huge confidence interval because there weren't that many frail people who were discharged in this way. This is a messy slide. I apologize for it. But I want to show you that in using three different methods that we have used over the years for predicting risk of surgery, and post-operative death and, and complications. So this is the EAGLE, this is the Lee, and this is the ASA. If you add to that frailty, you get a much more sensitive and specific marker of having post-operative complications or death. So when you do your pre-op con consultation, this is really important to think about. A simpler scale to use that John Morley put together is called the frail scale. And the F is for fatigue. I feel tired all the time, most of the time for the last month. R is resistance, difficulty walking up 10 steps alone without resting and without aids. A for ambulation, difficulty walking several hundred yards alone and without aids. Any five of these illnesses, and loss of weight, and here it's over 5% in the last year. So slightly different than what uh, Freed has, but similar, and you can do this at the bedside. Again, zero robust, one to two here were considered pre frail and three and more were considered frail. And these were their results when they looked, again, zero is robust, one, is um, one and two are frail, pre-frail, and these are frail, okay? And they looked to see what happened over time and percentage that died, the percentage over five years who developed a physical limitation, 
same for men as for women, okay? So again, it's a simpler thing to use, but it can give you similar outcomes. The time to up and go can be used as a frailty measure. It's very, very specific, but it's not sensitive. So if their timed up and go is over 15 seconds, they're frail or pre-frail. But if it isn't, it doesn't mean they are not, okay? So back to the big picture of prognosis in older adults, we've talked about stratifying by function, frailty measures. Let's talk a little bit about disease trajectories for quality of life and life expectancy. So this is, I, you probably have seen these trajectories. This is the cancer trajectory. Note that this is not the beginning of the cancer. This is the beginning of incurable cancer, okay? And people do pretty well until they don't. And they tend to not about two months before death, okay? This is organ system failure trajectory. You treat these folks all the time. CHF, COPD, whoops, functions down. You treat them, they come back, but they don't quite come back to where they were, okay? And then in two or five to five years, death occurs. It always seems sudden because they always came back from this but this time they didn't. So those are cancer, heart failure, and this is dementia and frailty. It's kind of the dwindles. You start at a lower function and over time you die. And this of course is what we all think is gonna to happen to us. We're gonna to go to sleep one day and not wake up, okay? So as I mentioned, there are key features that signal changes in trajectory, and there's that light bulb I want going off. The reason is that this is the time to talk to the patient and the family. Things have changed. So if we look at trajectory changes for organ diseases and cancer, impaired performance status, impaired nutritional status, decreased serum albumin, all seem very good at at um, uh, projecting when death will death is imminent over the next six months. Congestive heart failure, at least half of patients will die within five years. That's changing a little bit, but not a whole lot. Overall annual mortality ranges um, from five to 75 percent. To get into hospice with CHS, CHF, which is supposed to be that you will die within six months. You need to be New York Heart Association class four and getting optimal treatment, <clears throat> which of course has been changing. And these are secondary supporting factors for getting into hospice. This is a study that was done looking at this and they found that people who were class three or four and hospitalized with three or more of these had, were likely to have survival of less than six months. So again, trying to figure out when in that curve, as it dips and comes up and dips and comes up, it might not come up again. Dementia is a leading cause of morbidity, morbidity and mortality and institutionalization. There are different stages of dementia. And as a geriatrician, I'm gonna take this moment to just go through those with you because when you're talking prognosis with your patients, you should know these. So this is the uh, Folstein mini mental status exam. It's zero to 30. Um, this is mild cognitive impairment, mild dementia, moderate dementia, severe dementia of any type. We're not just talking Alzheimer's here. And you can see how the um, scores go down. The time course, MCI is preclinical from what we see. And then we start moving. And it can be, you know, a long course. It can be, but it does tend to decrease life expectancy by at least six years. And the functional impairment changes. So that if you have somebody with mild dementia, you need to talk to them and their families about finances, driving, and medications. If it's moderate, then they're going to start having difficulty with walking, doing their own IADLs. Um, and gait and balance, and then of course severe 
It's even uh, the ability to swallow. These are some of the things that happen in cognitive changes. Um, you folks have the slides and I would uh, encourage you to send them out to folks. Behavioral issues and apathy and depression as people are beginning to realize what's going on. And then complications that happen. You know, they um, have no sense of money and uh, are going to the bank all the time. They're unable to live alone and start falling. And then, of course, the end uh, complications that occur in this terrible disease. So the first thing to recognize is dementia is a terminal disease. People die from dementia and its complications. What predicts a high six-month mortality? Interestingly, pneumonia, a febrile episode, whether it's pneumonia or not, and difficulties with eating, which is actually a progression of disease. So this is a study that came out on 2009, looking at uh, nursing home patients to see when in the course of their uh, dementia, they, um, there was an effect on their survival. So these are patients who did not have pneumonia. These are patients who did have pneumonia. Marked decline in life expectancy. Febrile episode, febrile episode. And this is pretty impressive. No eating problem, eating problem. So when my patients start to have trouble uh, coughing when they're eating or their first aspiration pneumonia, I call in the family. I say, things are different now, okay? We're on, it's, death is closer than it was. Hospice uses the FAST uh, stage 7A, which I will show you in a moment, plus one of the following. So if your patient has any of these, they can go into hospice, or if they are stage 7C. So stage 7A and 7C. And here you can see 7A is the ability to speak limited to about six or less intelligible different words in the course of an average day. So those have the other complications. And then when the ambulatory ability is lost um, and they have gone through most of these, they can go into hospice, okay? How about diseases and how to figure out life expectancy? Well, I think you're probably all familiar with these. We have a number of these for single diseases. My older patients and yours, however, usually have more than one disease. So the question is, how do we prognosticate for them? And again, function is a great way to uh, get the area under the curve, basically, to see um, how um, likely they are to develop poor quality of life, morbidity, and mortality. Prognostic indices are another one, and that's e-prognosis. And I don't know if you're aware of that or not, but I just want to show you, if you just put in e-prognosis, this is what you'll get. This is from UCSF. Um, it's very well done. There are calculators, which I'll show you in a minute. There are cancer screenings. So if you're wondering if you should do breast cancer screening or colonoscopy on your older patient. This is very helpful. And there's even now some talking about what I'm gonna be talking about in a few minutes, how do you communicate prognosis? So the first thing they show you is where is your patient? Because depending on where they are, there are different calculators and they're of different validity. Outcomes of hospitalization for older, hospitalization is a critical event in the life of an older person, okay? 30 to 40% lose one or more basic ADLs at discharge compared with admission, pre-admission. Pre-admission is about two weeks before they were admitted, when the ill, you know, before they started to get sick. And 25 to 40% are still impaired three months later, and this is now, I think, 18.5% are readmitted within 30 days. Another one of those slides, take a deep breath, and I'll show you what we're looking at. So over here on the left, you're seeing people who were discharged at their baseline function, able to do what they were able to do 
two weeks prior to admission. These are people, the right-hand column for each of these, who were discharged with a new or additional disability in ADLs, okay? Here we're looking at how were they doing one month after discharge, three months, six months, and one year. So you can see that those who were discharged with um, at baseline were excuse me, those who were discharged with a disability were back to baseline, a third of them, by a month, okay? But 53% of them were still in decline and 13% had died. If you look a year later, 30% are back at their baseline, almost 40% have died. Now, it's not that they've lost an ADL that's caused them to die. Obviously, this is their, um, it's a marker for us to look at. But nonetheless, people who did not lose an ADL did much, much better. So I'm going to give you two cases to think about. Mr. Walter is an 80-year-old man, independent in his ADLs, has CKD with a creatinine of 3.2 on admission, albumin 2.9, hospitalized with pneumonia. And the question is, oops, his respiratory status improves over the course of his hospitalization. His hospital course is complicated by episodes of delirium, which led to functional decline. And at discharge, he is now dependent in transferring, toileting, and bathing, where here he was independent. So what's the probability that he'll die in the year following his hospitalization? Pick a number, write it down, commit yourself. And then I'm gonna show you, if you went to ePrognosis and used this screen, which is the Lee and Walter screen, they ask biological sex, they ask on discharge, what's happening in terms of their function. And they ask about um, other disorders that we know affect prognosis. So congestive heart failure, metastatic cancer, creatinine, and albumin at admission. And you get points for this. And our patient had six points. And so the one-year mortality for Mr. Walter is 64% with a confidence interval of 58 to 70, okay? Mr. N, on the other hand, lives in a nursing home. He's been there for about a year. He has Alzheimer's and hypertension and was hospitalized with sepsis in the setting of an aspiration pneumonia. He is dependent in all of his ADLs, but he sits up in a chair most of the day. He occasionally smiles and speaks minimally. What's the probability that he will die in six months, not a year, six months following his hospitalization? Same numbers. Commit yourself. There's a different um, study, uh, different, uh, it's not an algorithm, but you know what I'm talking about. Risk calculator for nursing home adults, 65 and older, and it gives six months survival. So if you look here, have they been admitted in the past 90 days? How old are they? What's their sex? Do they have shortness of breath? Pressure ulcer of stage two or more, totally dependent in ADLs, bed bound most of the day, have insufficient intake, bowel incontinence, low BMI, recent weight loss, and congestive heart failure. And so for our patient, he ended up here, 34 to 43% risk of mortality in the next six months. Obviously much higher in the next year. So that's the data that you can use in talking to people and families and giving what you think are the likely benefits and the likely harms of what will be happening. I want to spend the last period of time with you talking about how do you have the conversation? 
So you've probably seen the slide before if you've ever been to a palliative care talk. There's no easy way I can tell you this, so I'm sending you to someone who can. Our hope is that we all can do this, and I think during COVID, unfortunately, we all learned how to do this. But let's talk it through, and let me give you a couple of things that you can put in your back pocket for when you are needing to do this. Why don't we talk about prognosis? Let's think about that. It's not part of our daily routine, right? We go in, we talk a little bit, we check the heart, maybe we you know, check the abdomen and the calves, we look at the numbers, but we don't talk about prognosis with the patient. It requires time, you need to step back from what you're doing, and we're ambivalent about it. We don't wanna give bad news, and we're uncomfortable that we may not be right, and we probably won't be right, okay? We'll be in a ballpark, but we won't be absolutely right. So we talked about these three types of prognosis, end of life, if somebody has a serious illness, and for treatment decisions. So this is the third piece of information that you should take with you from this talk. An effective discussion about prognosis is not giving a pill of information. And this comes from Bob Arnold of Pittsburgh. It's about assessing exactly what the patient wants to know, attending to specific concerns, attending to their emotions, which is hard for many of us. And so it's helpful to have a framework and some language and phrases at your fingertips that you can use when you're doing this. The first thing that is so important is establishing the proper setting. Make it private, comfortable, Sit down. Don't look like you're trying to get out the door. Turn off or forward your pager or your cell phone. This is a very, very important discussion. And don't do it on the way out the door. You may laugh about this, but when I was a fellow um, at Cornell, I actually was with a patient and the intern and resident on their way out the door said, do you want to be a DNR? <laughs> okay, not really the way to have this conversation. And I would assume now nobody would do it that way. What do the patient and the family understand? If you don't know what they're thinking, misunderstandings are likely to happen. So what do they know about the illness? You can ask, what have the doctors told you about your or your wife's or your loved one's condition at this point? What is your understanding of the current medical situation? What's the effect of the illness on their lives? What's important to them? What things are hardest for you to do at this time that you want to do? What's changed the most for you with this illness? This gives you a sense of how they are being affected and what they think is going on with the illness they have. You need to do a medical review, but do not get in the weeds, okay? Summarize the big picture in a few sentences. Use the word dying if it's appropriate. Do not give an organ by organ, lab by lab medical review. Avoid jargon, we use a lot of it. If you're not sure if they understand, ask them. Answer whatever questions they have. So with the patients I was telling you about before, what I would say is often when your father eats, some of the food or water goes into his lungs. This is a sign that his dementia has progressed from moderate to severe, and we've entered a different phase of the illness. Okay, And at that point, we begin to talk about end-of-life care. I'm afraid I have some bad news. I wish things were different. Based on what you've told me and what I see, I believe your mother is dying. Hard conversations. When you discuss prognosis, use a range. Don't try to be specific, okay? Although I can't give you an exact time, given your illness and condition, I believe you have hours, to, I use hours to days, weeks to months, months to years. This is an average. Some people live longer and some live shorter. I hope you will be living longer. But that allows you to get into 
the best, worst, and most likely scenarios. So you can talk about what really matters to them and what they would like for the rest of their lives. So this is a marvelous article that you should take a look at. Dr. Schwartz is a surgeon um, navigating high-risk procedures with more than just a street map is what this article is called. And essentially, she had said, what's the difference between having surgery and not having surgery? So many people would say, okay, that's having surgery and this would be nothing. And she doesn't do that. She says surgery versus supportive care, okay, or palliative care, or whatever term you want. And she says, you know, if you look at this diagram, it's really beautifully done, that there's a much larger difference in the amount of time you might have if you choose surgery than if you choose supportive care. But you have even the best case, you're in the ICU for one to three weeks and you have to go to subacute rehab. More likely, you'll be in the ICU for two to six weeks and you'll be dead in two to three months. And worst case, you'll have complications in the ICU and you'll die in the ICU unable to talk to your family. Okay. With supportive care, best case is you'll have time to say goodbye, your pain will be controlled, you can die at home if that's what you want. Most likely, your pain will be controlled, but let's be honest, you'll be groggy, okay? We do. It's often a toss-up or trade-off uh, with pain medications, but it does give you some time for the family to get. And the worst case, time is short and death is imminent, okay? Now, it doesn't tell anybody what to do, but it certainly lays out the options much better than the way we usually do when we tell someone that they, um, if they want to have a chance to live however long they want to live, um, they need this high-risk procedure, okay? Then you have to deal with how people react to what you tell them. So silence is golden, it really is. Give it a chance while your words sink in. Prepare yourself for common reactions. These are not pleasant, but you really have to be able to take them on. There's acceptance, there's conflict and denial, there's grief and despair, there's anger, remember Cougar Ross, and really pay attention to the emotions, don't ignore them. Name it so you know what you're dealing with. You look shocked. Can you tell me what you're thinking? You appear angry. Can you tell me what in particular is upsetting you? I know that it's upsetting to get this diagnosis, but what in particular is making you feel as you are right now? Understand the emotion. Let them know that you get what they're going through. I can only imagine how scary, difficult, overwhelming this must be. And then explore the emotional state. And these are words that really help. Tell me more. Tell me more about how this is affecting you. If they say something you don't quite get, tell me more about this. So some helpful language for you to take with you. Um, what do you know about at the start of the conversation? What's happening medically? what your loved one would want. The I wish statement, which lets them know that you're on their side. Hope for the best, plan for the worst. Hours to days, weeks to month, tell me more. And silence is actually good at times. So in summary, patients and families value prognostic information. It helps them make better medical decisions more in line with their values. Medical prognostication is not an exact science, but evidence-based data does exist to help us provide useful information to patients and families. And if they live longer than we have said is likely, it's a wonderful thing, not a bad thing, okay? Foreseeing and foretelling are skills that can be learned and improved upon. So thank you very much.
Thank you so much, Dr. Leipzig. Uh, we'll welcome some questions, either uh, David unmuting people or we can use the chat function. I think whatever is more comfortable for an individual questioner. Yeah, everyone can unmute themselves if they want. It's an open, open mic situation now. Uh, I, I'm checking the chat also if you prefer to text instead of talking. Hi, Roseanne. This is, this is John Andrelli. I just wanted to say thank you so much for a great talk. Thank you, John. And I wanted to say, you know, I think there's a lot of science doctors. I think people are just really uncomfortable with having these conversations. And I think that the fact that you stressed kind of silence at a time is one of the most important things. I think that doctors often feel the residents that they have to fill that void when there's silence because everyone's uncomfortable. But it takes a while for the patients to process this. And I think the fact that you're stressing that is just so important for us to all remember. The other thing that, that is helpful is to have them tell you back, you know, the old talk back, what yeah. they heard. So you are sure you're on the same page. We have a question from Dr. Pigolini. It also sounds like a recommendation. Uh, he's asking is, are any of these scales integrated into EPIC? They are not integrated into EPIC. They are at different places. They are not here, okay? And we are trying to make that happen. Um, there actually is one that you can, there are different theories of frailty, okay? But there's one where there are about 36 different variables that contribute, all of which you can get from the medical record, okay? So down at Wake Forest, one of our former fellows, um, did this and put it into their um, uh, epic. It's been done up in Boston. So hopefully in the not too distant future, we will have this available because it would make a huge difference. You're right. Uh, we have another question from uh, Dr. Fatma, one of our residents. She's saying, are there any specific scales for patients with different type of cancers? Um, there probably are. I am not aware of that. Um, my concern with that is just um, being sure that cancer is the primary driving point of their prognosis. Because oftentimes, as we talk about, there are other pieces. Um, and I think cancer is actually a very important area to think about here because so many of the therapies can be toxic and particularly in older adults. Um, and we're kind of going by the seat of our pants on what to do about that. There are some studies that are looking at you know, lower doses or um, less duration of treatment for older people to see what happens. But I think the, the thinking of doing it this way makes a lot of sense. Um, for trying to decide, help somebody decide on treatments. Yeah. I have a, just a comment and a question, but so I'm Dr. So I'm one of the ID attendees. I, a wonderful talk. I, you know, just from, you know, the training I had early on in the 2000s, it, but this wasn't something we were given and our patients are getting older. My oldest patient in my clinic is in his 90s. Um, and I feel that, the age is just a number. So I, I love the cases that you presented. I love the scales and I love the website that you provided. I was looking for the app and then I first went to the app and then there was no app. So then I went to the website. <laughs> so now it's one of the favorites on there. Um, the question I have is, you know, one of, you know, so I deal with both HIV and non-HIV patients. Um, it's very challenging. This is a healthcare policy question. It's very challenging to get a home attendant I have an example of someone who's in their 80s who, you know, you see her very functional, you know, able to do majority of her ADLs, lives alone. Unfortunately, her husband passed away a few years ago, really doesn't have a social network, but it's very hard to get a home attendant for this patient. And I guess, you know, is there more movement as our patients are getting older? You know, as you know, the patients are getting, you know, our patient population is getting also increased. You know, what's your comment regarding that and services that are available for individuals as they're getting older? 
Okay. There actually are a lot of services available. New York is, is amazing in that. Um, obviously, if you have money, everything's possible. <laughs> um, Medicaid, it's getting harder and harder to get 24-hour care. Um, and that's, that's the issue. I think you really need to speak to a social worker who is in geriatrics. Okay. Okay. Because we, now we, we have, have our own, and she's worked hard. really hard, but it was it's it's been a challenge. Yeah. Has the um, HIV been a problem at all with this, or is it just that she's older? Uh, no. Um, in general, you know, it, for her, it's it's. I think yeah, you know, yes, it's. I think it's a bad example because yesterday I felt, you know, I'm getting worried about her because yesterday one of her blood pressure meds she had taken three inadvertently, thinking that it was the metropolo versus the amylidopine, even though they're on label and I spend a lot of time going through her, her medications every day. She actually brings her medications for the plus six plus years that I have seen her. We go through her meds all the time. Um, and it was just a red flag. And I'm like, you know, this is something, you know, we need to work on because I tried really hard when, her, especially when her husband passed away, but it just was not possible. I would suggest that you get a consult from your new outpatient yes. <laughs> yes. Um, for a lot of our patients we get blister packs for the medications yeah so yeah. they can't keep track of them but they know enough to you know take whatever's there yes so thank you one thank way to deal with it we have another question from a, one of our, our other residents frida she's asking how do you approach the conversation about two feedings and the family's expectation that better nutrition will translate into better prognosis? So that's a great question, okay? Um, we have gone from one side to the other. <laughs> so when I was in training, when Sam was in training, everybody got a peg, okay, <laughs> for everything. <clears throat> and then a, a uh, review came out that made it very clear that people with severe dementia or moderate dementia, do not improve. They do not have fewer f infections. They do not have fewer pressure ulcers, et cetera, et cetera, okay? Um, so then people stopped or tried to stop uh, putting them in. I think it's really important that we recognize, number one, that study was in dementia only, that feeding tubes are appropriate at certain times, Okay, like post stroke, et cetera. The other piece is that end of life uh, nutrition is a different story, if that's what you're referring to. <clears throat> and culturally, uh, food is love. Food means you care about somebody, you want them to eat because they're going to die if they don't eat and they're going to suffer. So I think what people need to learn is that there's actually data out there that says that people who are dying, okay, or, and, you know, at the, having a very severe illness and getting to that stage, don't feel hunger and they don't feel um, like they're starving, okay? And there's a, a study where nurses were asked if patients were suffering, um, and these were people who were terminally ill, some of whom had feeding tubes and others of whom didn't. And far and away, their sense was that it was the people without the feeding tubes who suffered less. So I think it's, it's trying to get a, a change in your mindset. And there actually are some um, things that are put out by HPM and other organizations that kind of make the case to help having these conversations with families. I think our last question is to be by Dr. Seward. Do you want to pose a question, Dr. Seward, yourself? Yeah, um, Dr. Leipzig, I was just asking if you have any advice how to navigate through uh, the experience I imagine many have had where you have the impression that other specialists involved in the care of the patient may be perhaps giving different prognostic guidance than, than what you think uh, might be true. So this is so common. 
Um, and every specialist thinks they're the only one involved in the case. And they give their opinion to the family and the patient before you have any idea that it's been given. So there's a whole etiquette, <laughs> etiquette question here. What I tend to do is I do a very funny thing. I pick up a phone. <laughs> I call people. I also develop um, group chats with the um, other specialists. And I say, I heard you said this. I heard you said this. Can we come together with what we think we should be saying to the patient so they get the same thing from us? And if we disagree, that's fine. We can have a family meeting. They can hear both of us and go from there. You know, but it takes time. The good news is we're now getting paid for some of this stuff. <laughs> Well, thank you very much for joining us uh, this morning and for a wonderful talk that's, as you said in your opening comments, is, is so timely in terms of our experience of the last six months, but certainly also um, integral to the provision of great care for the patients we care about so much. So thank you again. My pleasure. It was great to be here.